Our faithful carrier finished his route and the road led him here to the U.S. Supreme Court. We'll give you trusted expert analysis on what happened and what happens next. Hi, I'm Stuart Shepard and this is a very special edition of First Liberty Live. We're going to do a, a round table format today and just talk across the table uh, like you were sitting in your kitchen having this conversation. Gerald Groff served as a postal carrier in rural Pennsylvania, and he chose his faith over his job. Uh, when I was hired, there was no such thing as Sunday work for my position. And then around 2017, they signed a contract with Amazon that they were going to agree to deliver parcels on uh, Sundays and holidays as well as every other day of the week. And I, as a Christian, believe that it's not proper to work on Sundays at all. And so I took a stance asking them to accommodate me uh, by allowing me to not work on Sundays at all. Now the post office demanded that he work Sundays anyway, and the Supreme Court is currently deciding right now, as we speak, about what's going to happen, whether he's right or whether the post office is right or something in between. We're going to find all that out. Kelly Shackelford and Jeff Matier are here with us. Kelly, of course, is president, CEO, and chief counsel of First Liberty Institute, and he's someone who's actually argued at the U.S. Supreme Court, stood up there at the lectern. And uh, Jeff Matier, of course, is our executive vice president and chief legal officer. Hi, Kelly. Hi, Jeff. Good to see you, Stuart. It's going to be a fun day. It's going yeah. to be here. Thanks yeah, for fun. coming. Yeah, this, uh, this is one that I really wanted to hear your insights because both of you got to sit in the courtroom as this was being argued. So you got the closest in-person view of this whole thing. And I just want to hear your perceptions on what you saw while you were there. First, draw a picture for us. What was it like being there in the courtroom? What did you see? What did you smell? All that. Well, that was actually the closest I've ever been to the justices, like all of the justices at once because I've been in the court a number of times but this time there were four of us at the council table and so one of the chairs they put at the end of the table which is literally in front of the lectern. <laughs> I think most people don't understand how close everything is in that court. I, I, I mean I was right next to Amy Coney Barrett so much so that it was a little too close <laughs> and so uh, and my you know and so so that was close um, and I, but I would tell people the way it works there's a, it's a really stately room, as you might guess. There's all, all these lawgivers up chiseled into the stone, including Moses holding the Ten Commandments and all this, and very large ceilings. Um, and the way it starts is kind of fun. I've always enjoyed it, which is behind the bench, which is raised up, are some columns, and in between the columns, some red curtains. Very red. Ve very red, velvety kind of curtains. Yeah. And at 10 a.m. Eastern, the, the, there's no justices. There's nobody there in front of you. At ten, if first your first time, this is what you, you might be a little shocked. <laughs> there's this big gavel that hits, oh. and they announce that the court is in session, and they say a prayer. I might mention the the marshal, but at the moment that gavel hits, what you don't realize is all the justices have already lined up behind the curtains, and boom, they all come out at one time and they sit. So it's a, I don't know a little way of like an NBA basketball game or something <laughs> or a college basketball with uh, all they need is like the smoke machine and, <laughs> and a few uh, lasers going yeah on. <laughs> so it's really dramatic it's supposed to be formal and that's how it starts uh, so it and there was a room full there's right behind us who are at the front table of the arguing council on the other side are the Supreme Court bar those are members who are admitted to the Supreme Court bar, therefore they are allowed to argue at the Supreme Court. Yeah. If Jeff and I were there on another case to just watch, that's where we would sit. Okay. Then there's a, a rail, and it looks like, like if you go to a courtroom, you know how the, the party uh, and the attorney are at a table, and then there's this, this rail that runs across, yeah. and then the general audience. Uh, the general audience sits behind that. Was it packed? Was it full? Uh, pretty much so, yeah. Okay. This is the only religious liberty case of the of the term, and that holds. I don't know if it's two to three hundred, but somewhere around there. I think probably around two hundred. But they're spaced a little bit. They're they're kind of like pew chairs, you know. Yeah. They're they're not like individual chairs. They're in a long pew, and they uh, space that out. And so that is the. Oh, by the way, to the side, if you're facing the lectern, arguing to the court, to your left also is the media. So they, they, there's no video allowed, no cameras. So there's a sketch artist sketching all that's going on, and there are all the major newspapers are going to report her there. On the other side are, are guests 
of the justices. So you'll see some family members and things like that. Of course, there were more for this than most cases because, again, this was the only religious liberty case of the term. Yeah. Jeff, this whole thing comes down to the, the measure that the court system applies when there's a religious accommodation request made to an employer, whether it should be low, whether it should be high, whether it should be somewhere in the middle. What does the plain text of the law say, and where did we argue that that line ought to be? What, what, what the plain text of Title VII says that an employer has to grant a religious accommodation if it's not an undue hardship upon the, the employer. So you have to grant it unless the employer comes forth with evidence showing that it's an undue hardship. So, and, and, and explain what undue hardship is, because that's it's not just a couple no. of words. Those have very specific meanings. Well, well I mean, right? I mean, well, they do. Now, und, in Title VII, it's undefined, and so that's what the case is. That's what the case is all about. Okay. And and so what does what does undue hardship mean? I mean, that's that's what the case eventually will will answer. There's a case from that was talked about almost in every question from 1970. TWA versus Hardison. That case in Ditka says, not Ditka, the, the football coach, <laughs> but Ditka, D-I-C-T-A, says that undue hardship equals de minimis. Now, look, there's no one, no English, per, nobody who, who knows anything about the English language thinks that the word undue hardship. So a hardship it's not just a hardship, it's an undue hardship, yeah. somehow translates just a de minimis burden. Which is the, minim, the, most, just, the smallest amount. Yeah, the time anything over anything. A trifling yeah. is another definition yeah. for it. Nothing, basically. So currently, the, the courts apply that de minimis standard. So if the employer can say, well, this is, this is just bothersome, then pretty much they would win the case, right? I mean, uh, maybe an oversimplification. You, you mean one of the things that came out in argument and questions were about employee morale. And so, oh, you know, we're, we're you know, because someone doesn't want to work on, on, on Saturday because they're an observant um, Jew, that, well, I, I don't like that, that, well, that, that, that upsets me. You know, I'm upset about that. Well, morale is bad. Yeah. That, under that standard, that's enough. Because it's, it's anything. Yeah, I saw media articles from the far left that were saying this is the Christian right wanting to take over uh, every place of employment. That's not it either, though, right? We're not saying that the employee should always win. Well, first, the whole idea, the Christian right. I mean, this is every denomination that has Sabbath. There are a lot of denominations that have Sabbaths, right? I mean, there's Orthodox Jews, there's there are Hindus, there are all kinds of people that, that they all filed their briefs saying that they need protection. And I, I want to make sure and set this. 50, 51 years ago, Congress specifically passed these words to say, you better accommodate religion unless you can show an undue hardship. Five years later, the U.S. Supreme Court defined the word undue hardship as de minimis. They just wiped it off. The, I mean, this yeah. is really brazen. Now, you might say, well, why did they do that? They did it because back then they had this idea that you couldn't do anything that favored or helped religion if you were the government. And therefore, this law was going to help religion. So they had to kind of swipe it out a little bit. Well, it, the Supreme Court can't change statutes. And we now know that it's okay to provide accommodations for religion. That's, that's what our country is all about. So everybody in that courtroom, in my opinion, and really everybody who spoke, all the justices, the Solicitor General admitted undue hardship does not mean de minimis. Now that's the good news, that this is going to change. We are, we are going to win the victory of de minimis is not going to be used anymore. So let me say it back to you. Both sides agree that the current standard is too low. I mean, everybody agrees. But the fuss then is over where that standard is going to be, right? Yeah. Well, I I don't know. I mean, I, 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 I know Justice Gorsuch tried to, quote, find common ground yeah. with the Solicitor General. And I think if you asked her that question, I think she would dodge it, which, which I, think, I, think, I think both Kelly and I, I agree on this. It, the Solicitor General of the United States. Who was representing the post office. Re represents the post office, is a very effective um, oral advocate. However... She doesn't answer things exactly straight. And I think if you listen to the whole argument, you'll see at different 
point. She says different things in response to the same question. <laughs> and, and Justice Alito, I, I mean, at one point got very frustrated at, 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 at I her. I heard that. Yeah. And so I don't know if she really, because she doesn't want the test to change. She right. doesn't. She wants it still to say de minimis. She just wants de minimis to be interpreted more fully or based upon the opinion. I mean, you know, it's vague and and a little. I, I, mean, I don't know how to describe it. Right. Yeah. It's 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 the best way. I the things that came to my mind was 1984, like <laughs> double speak, yeah. and and Alice in Wonderland. I mean, saying word, just changing the meaning of words. So what she wants, she knows that it defies common sense to say that the words undue hardship is the same thing as a trifling or really not that important in the civil rights area. But she's an attorney and she's trying to represent a client. So she's, trying so to she's like, ooh, I'm going to lose the word. So what I need to do is say, yeah, yeah, I'm okay with losing the word, but let's keep everything else the same. Really, what the courts have been doing for the last 46 years, they haven't really been following the idea of de minimis. They've really been doing something higher. And so it's just working great. It's working <laughs> fine. This, she said, it is working yeah. fine. I mean, the arrogance of the federal government standing up and speaking for all religious groups who they're persecuting and saying it's working great for them. When she's the attorney for the employer who's causing <laughs> right. the problem yes. for the religious guy, well, right? And, and Justice Alito, I mean, to me, I, I, there are probably several favorite moments, but maybe the, the best moment is when Justice Alito literally picks up all the amicus briefs. Which are the friend of the court briefs. Friend of the court briefs, the court briefs filed on our side. On our side from very diverse religious groups and basically going through, I mean, all these religious groups, and, and he holds up, you know, the various uh, uh, briefs that they filed, and uh, that they're wrong. I mean, they disagree with the Solicitor General because it is a problem. All these groups, um, their briefs demonstrate that this has not been applied fairly, and that, it, that courts have taken the words de minimis to mean de minimis. Um, I, I kind of, you said to Orwell, I kind of think it's almost like she was doing a Jedi mind, you know, just for the Star Wars. Like, no, the words de minimis don't mean de minimis. This is exactly. The they mean you were looking this is, exactly, exactly. Um, and it's a good that our, you know, Aaron Street, who, who argued the case on behalf of Gerald, our, our, our network attorney, who, who did such a good job. His job was to, you know, to basically say, no, no, no. Um, let's get right back. It, let's get back right to, to the words. So it's, we've got the undue hardship standard, which is what's the plain text of the law. Yes. We've got de minimis, which is what they later said. Now what those words mean is really this. In the course of this, though, I heard other descriptions being tossed around. And I've got a, I wrote some of them down. Significant difficulty, substantial cost, premium cost, that kind of thing. What was that all about? I, I had trouble tracking. Well, that. what was going on was, number one, Aaron Street, who did a, an incredible job, uh, he was our, our counsel at the lectern, did, did a great job in, in the midst of all this. I thought the rebuttal at the end, if people really go funny. back and listen, yeah. uh, the rebuttal at the end was just, he nailed it. Um, what was going on is, how do you define undue burden? If it's not de minimis, which everybody knows it's not, yeah. what is the definition? Well, our proposal and Aaron's proposal was, you know what? This word has been defined in other federal statutes, like the Americans with Disabilities Act, and how to accommodate them. The same reasonable accommodation language and the same undue hardship language. Yeah. And it says significant difficulty or expense, right? So it defines it. And so Aaron said, you know, that's a good definition. That's kind of the plain meaning of the words. You can even see how it's been you know, rolled out in cases. And that was our proposal because it's, but we're like anything that really is a really an undue burden. Substantial cost was something really that Justice Kavanaugh brought out. It was in a footnote, yeah. footnote 14, in yeah. the Hardison decision, which came up with this de minimis idea, you know, 46 years ago. Okay. And he said, well, maybe they really meant substantial cost. Well, that sounds great and everything until what, what, and when Aaron got up at the lectern again, at the very end, he said, you can't go with that word if it's what it meant in this case. Because what that said is, any premium, any increase in wages in order to accommodate, you lose. Yeah. So if you're Amazon and, and you have to increase, you have to pay an extra $100 a week in order to accommodate religious freedom, 
That's an undue hardship. As right? a hypothetical. But under yeah. this. Sub yeah. That's a substantial cost. <laughs> well, it's not. Not for Amazon. But the, the point yeah. is, this, this case that they're trying to hold on to is just wrong. And what you had happen was the justices are trying not to, they know that they've got to change. This is wrong. But they're trying to see, is there a way they can do this with less disruption? And in the process of that, they're not being honest with the words. And, it, well, I mean, in the discussion, we'll give them benefit of the doubt. We'll see what they come out with. But yeah. you had people who are more conservative on the court who were trying to find that way to not, you know, do too much of a change. But it, it, you've got to go to what the words mean. And whatever that means, your job as the justices is not to be politicians. Your job is to say, this is what the law says. And that is the battle going on. You've got people on the court who do not like religious freedom and want less protection. And they are trying to pull the, the more conservatives on the court to say, don't disrupt things, go with the middle ground. And that's what the Solicitor General was saying. Oh, yeah, get rid of the name de minimis, but let's keep everything we've been doing for the last 46 and, and, and Chief years. Justice Roberts has really pressed for and, and pushed the court toward taking the law for what Congress meant when they passed it. I mean, he's really been a stickler for that in many cases along the way where if that's what the law says and you don't like it, change the law. Don't come to court trying to change it, right? Right. And that, they tried that argument. This is what, this is what Kagan tried. And in in again, a, a Jedi mind, you know, her point was, well, if Congress wants to change it, they can change it. Well, Congress didn't, Congress wrote this into the law and, and the Supreme Court screwed it up, which everybody admits they screwed it up. Yeah. It's not Congress's job. It's your job to go back to what the words were that they passed and follow those words. So it was incredible to see, but you could see what there, there are those on the court and certainly the Solicitor General that don't want any real change, but I think it's clear, no matter what, we are moving to a, to a point of more protection for religious freedom in the workplace. The question is, are we moving all the way to what the statute says, or are they gonna end up with some sort of uh, compromise thing that they come up with that's not really honoring the words? I hope that they'll go to the, the really what the statute says, but we're not going to know until June when this decision comes out, and people need to pray for the court because yeah. they're going to be battling this out. Uh, one of the guesses by Aaron Street was that, you know, the chief gets to pick one case a month. He thinks he'll pick this case because this is going to be like herding cats to get everybody <laughs> together on this thing, and and we'll see what happens and what they come out and, with. But and quite frankly, battle. this could be a this could be a it may not be a one one case and this issue is done yes i mean i i think sitting there and i, I was hopeful going in that it would would be yeah um and then two hours later but two hours later because some <laughs> of the questioning yeah. and certainly from from folks who we usually consider supportive of, of religious liberty rights didn't see at least to have some questioning on it that there could be that this is this is a case in which what they do is they overturn the Third Circuit. They say, no, you're wrong. It's de minimis is not the standard, but then they don't give much guidance on, well, what does, you know, the, the standard's not de minimis, the standard is undue hardship. Now, I, I will tell you as a, and I'll you know, put my old hat on as a trial lawyer, yeah. I'll, I'll take that for, for future cases as long as the district courts Actually, if they submit a question to a jury and the employer has to show in order to succeed on a defense against a religious uh, accommodation request to, you know, did the employer, was the employer imposed an undue hardship? I mean, I'll take that to a jury every time if, if, if they let us, you know, go to the jury on it. Yeah. Um, but fleshing out what that means that may be a future case i mean unfortunately but for gerald what it would mean is he would win in the sense that he's still alive and, and, and goes back to the the district court and we get to then try that issue um and you get a you get a situation like coach kennedy right because we're going to go all the way back and then we'll start again, you know, based upon what the court does does there. So it may be, it may be that that, that that's where 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 we're headed. It, was it significant that the court sets an hour for this case to be heard? 
I looked at my watch when the other side was still going. They started out, and it was they were already 50 minutes in mm -hmm. before they ever finished their side. The whole thing went nearly two hours full. Was does that tell us anything? What is what can we glean? Yeah, from I, wasn't, that? I wasn't that surprised by that. Yeah. Um, I, this is a big case. Um, this is this is going to. Whether they specifically overrule or not, this is going to change a 46-year precedent Yeah, that is really an embarrassment. Um, and so they're trying to figure out how to do that. So a lot of their questions weren't if they're going to go to a different standard. The question was, how, what is the standard? How do we do this? How do we give information to the judges below so that they don't feel lost? Um, and then there were some who were like, well, do we really have to go any further than just change the standard and we'll let them do all that? And so that's sort of a battle going on. Yeah. Overturn, but then just throw it back down without a lot more info because we really can't answer all these questions. Or do we overthrow and then kind of say, hey, here's some guidance on how you do this, which is really hard when the Cong what the Congress put in place was a balancing test. It was a context type test. It was an undue hardship depends a lot on the, the facts, right? Mm -hmm. An undue hardship for, you know, um, Amazon is different than an undue hardship for a person that has 20 employees. Yeah. And so that's really hard to kind of lay all that out, but that's the struggle they were going through in the court. And, uh, uh, but I, I just want people to realize the good news is this is moving in a positive way for religious freedom. No matter what, this is moving in a positive way. It's just a matter of how far it's going to move. And as Jeff said, if it doesn't move far enough, we'll if back. we get, we'll just come back. Well, we, yeah. we, I mean, we have the cases now. Um, our, yeah. our, our cases representing the uh, employees of CVS, who, who CVS, the pharmacy. Will, the yeah. pharmacy, who will no longer grant religious accommodations not to participate in prescribing uh, medicines that induce abortions. I mean, that's the whole issue is, I mean, they've asked for it and, you know, CVS responds, oh, no, 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 if we grant this, even though in the past we have and there were never any issues, it's we more mean, than forget that. So we're it's, more, it's more than de minimis. And therefore, we, we win. So, I mean, we, we've got the cases in yeah. line if, 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 it, if it isn't fully corrected in, in this case. One, one of the comments that I've seen in our social media, uh, there are a, a couple of directions people go. One is they, they fuss over what is the Sabbath. So they want to say, well, it's Saturday or it's Sunday or you're doing it wrong or, you, you know, the Fourth Commandment's no yeah. longer in effect. That's not what this case is about. Yeah. It's not Nothing whether he's that. right. It's whether he has the right. So that's yeah. why I've been responding to people. Yeah, the, on that. The, I mean, the, the, the court, I mean, it, 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 to make the religious accommodation, it, 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 it's, it, it, they have not disputed. No one's disputed that Gerald actually is a Sabbath honoring yeah. person, that this is a legitimate, reasonable uh, request. I mean, that, that, that's not an issue. No. And, and the key to that is, I think, the people on social who are bringing up these other points of view, if he wins, it protects them, too, for what they believe. Right. That's right. And that's the key to this. No it matter is. which position you take, this protects you. And it's not just Sabbath, right? This is about Sabbath. But when they change the standard for protection of religious freedom, it protects everybody's religious freedom. So it's, it's not limited to just a Sabbath request at all. It is religious freedom in the workplace. So this is really, really important for every person of faith who works yeah. and their kids who will work and their grandkids who will work. I mean, this is, we are, we are gonna increase the protection for people at a time where it's really needed. I mean, you know, we've got a lot of uh, these massive corporations who are just crushing people of faith. And the law protects that because we so value that. Uh, you go back to the history of why they passed this. I mean, they, the, you know, the, the people in this country value religious freedom. We, if we can accommodate people, we want people to have their religious freedom. We shouldn't be forcing people across the country to choose between their faith and their job. And if we get a good standard, I'll tell you what's going to happen. Yeah. What's going to happen is these corporations are going to have to sit down with the employee and they, they can easily figure a way to accommodate. But when there's no real burden on them to do anything because they've so eviscerated the protection, they can just do what they want. 
But if they restore the standard, which again, I think we're going to get there eventually, hopefully in this case, um, it's going to lead to a lot of situations being worked out. And, and it's easy to do with switching schedules. It's easy to do with a lot of these factual scenarios we have. The other thing that comes up in social is, is what's the difference between a religious accommodation and someone who just makes a heartfelt request? Uh, one example that I heard along the way was, you know, I'm a dad. I take that very seriously, and I want Saturdays off so I can go to my kids' games. It's not for religious reasons, but, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a heartfelt request. What's the difference between those two in the law? One's protected and one's not. Yeah. Why is that? Help because us we value religious freedom. Um, you know, we have a free exercise clause, which says you can exercise your religion. Other people might want to exercise something important to them, but if it's not religion, they don't get protection. We, you know, this is a country that was founded really somewhat out of people wanting to come to a place where there was religious freedom. So we've always valued that. Those, you know, uh, really accommodation we've had accommodation laws from the very beginning of our country because we know that different people have different faiths yeah. right i mean I, I think back to desmond doss and and that whole situation in the military where you've got a seven-day adventist you couldn't carry a weapon and they tried to court martial him because he was a medic and he wouldn't carry him a weapon but he won because we valued that diverse religious freedom and the result was we had a guy who was so so committed to preserving life that he crawled back in the enemy camp and ended up saving 70 extra people at his own expense. We would have lost a guy like that yeah. if we didn't value diversity and religious freedom. And that's what we want to do in the workplace. We'll get the best workers, the best people. And if you can accommodate, you should accommodate. If you can do it, it's, what it says is a reasonable accommodation. Not required to be unreasonable, but if you can do it, do we do it. That's what we do in America. Yeah, and go I ahead, think, Yeah, and no, I was just going to add on, because I think it's, I, it, to put this in, in context of our work, because I th actually I think Justice Alito tried to do this, and I think perhaps, at least my theory was he was speaking to, to, to a couple of his colleagues who have been with him on this journey of having a, 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 a back to the fundamentals of protecting religious liberty, a back to the original meaning of the First Amendment with regard to the religious um, religion clauses. And he pointed that out in, in, in reminding, I think, them that, hey, you know, like last term, we had this significant case called Kennedy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and, and he didn't mention it by name, but, but I think it, the undertone was like, this court has been taking us back to an original meaning of the religion clauses. And that where Kennedy dealt with public employees, and it was the First Amendment restoring religious liberty rights, Groff now takes us into the private employment. And again, it's through statute, but Title VII gives that protection. And so if we're gonna protect public employees, like Joe Kennedy, mm -hmm. then shouldn't we protect people like uh, Gerald Groff and others in, in employment. And so it under Title VII, which applies to both public employees and even broader um, private employees. The, the other part of this that I don't understand, so I, I would like you to help me figure this out. I don't get what happens next. Will the Supreme Court say, here's what the standard is, now go on your way? I also hear you talking about them sending it back down to the lower courts. I don't get the process. I don't want to get into the weeds, but just help us understand what happens. I know you're not asking this much process, but I mean, probably a lot of the viewers don't know. The first thing they're going to do is they're going into a room. Yeah. I mean, they're, they're going into a room this week, the nine justices, with nobody else in the room. Okay. And they are voting on this case. And there will be a majority and a, and, a, and a dissent, most likely. And then the senior judge in each of those camps gets to decide who writes that opinion. Right. They will begin drafting. They will share those. They will try to convince people to change. And that's, so that's the process. So that's why I say people pray. There's a lot of spiritual warfare that's going on in all those conversations between now and June when the decision will come out. What they're, what, what they're almost assuredly going to do is change the standard. Because de minimis is not the standard. And that, the Court of Appeals had de minimis as the standard. Yeah. That was the law. So it would be really unusual if they changed the standard and didn't send it back down to give them another try knowing what the standard is now. Okay. Which that in itself is a victory for Gerald because Gerald was over. Right? I mean, they had said... 
You're done. You're done. Yeah. Well, this would go back where he would now have a standard that would be more protective of religious freedom and would give him a chance. And the question is what that standard is going to be, how they're going to lay that out, um, and we'll so, wait and see. So they set the standard for the country, but then the case has to go back to the appeals court so Gerald's specific case can be dealt that, with them exactly. as standard, right? That, that's probably the most, I mean, I, if I had to say the most likely scenario. That's, they may do something else. Well, there are two that, others. I mean, the other yeah. would be they say, well, no, the standard it's not de minimis. It's undue hardship. Undue hardship means significant costs, burden on the conduct of the business. Mm. Okay, and the evidence in this case, and there's actually an admission by the post office that it didn't meet that standard. And so the court could say, I mean, this would be you know grand slam, yeah. huge victory, you know, Something Kennedy like <laughs> in, in 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 victory in saying Gerald wins. Don't need to go back. Gerald wins. He gets his job back. He wins. So that is possible. That, it's in the realm of possibility, but based on the argument, I wouldn't say it's the most likely. Okay. The Solicitor General wants the rever complete reverse. Right. She wants to say, well, it, 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 you know, de minimis isn't the standard. It's, 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 and again, it's hard to describe what she wants because <laughs> she's not really clear in it. It's yeah. de minimis, the words de minimis aren't the standard, but the de minimis test is the test, and Gerald didn't meet it, so um, it, it, they can say de minimis isn't the test. It's undue it's it's undue hardship which means something like the yeah. and Gerald the evidence he the post office had enough evidence so they went okay I, that's very unlikely um, the it, it is the I think the most likely is this is the stand that the standard is not de minimis it's undue hardship go back to the trial court all the way back okay re Continue to litigate, which that means we may be, I mean, it's maybe years. Mike Kennedy. We may may come back up in three years yeah. or four years. <laughs> wow. Okay. So I, that helps. I, I just needed some clarity on that because I, I was struggling with it. I, I do want to point out this was a serious team effort. We worked alongside two other groups, and we had the, the uh, attorney team for the volunteers. They worked pro bono for free from Baker Bots. I just want to give you guys a chance to acknowledge the folks that we worked alongside in this case. Well, it was great. Uh, we've known Randy Winger uh, at the Independent Law Center for years. Um, he was the one really who got the case first. Yeah. And, uh, um, and then he reached out to a guy who's really been in, spending his whole career fighting for these very types of cases, um, Alan Reinock uh, with the Church State Council. Yeah. And so we had this incredible experienced people at the trial level that had really focused on this a long time. And, uh, and so it was, it was great to work with them. And then we brought in, um, you know, uh, Aaron Streets argued a number of times for the Supreme Court. Is, he said is, this was his third, that he's been really one up front. He's, he's been there sitting at the desk other times. He's, he's, he's excellent um, at what he does and did a great, great job. Um, and uh, so it really is the best team you could assemble. And, and our friends, you know, uh, Randy Winger would say that and Alan Ronock would say that. They were just thrilled with what had come together to give Gerald the very best chance of winning and also the very, very best chance of getting this corrected this thing that has been going on for 46 years yeah. is now the beginning of the correction is here and, and kelly this is the model that when you created started launched founded whatever word you want to use uh what is now first liberty institute this is the model you had in mind of people working together finding the best volunteer attorneys to represent and all that what what's it feel like seeing this actually happen at the very very highest level it's it's really it's rewarding it's encouraging um, I, I really think God blesses that when his children work together. Um, I'll just say that's not typical at the Supreme Court. Um, for those who watch Lord of the Rings, this is like <laughs> the ring that's to get what. your chance to argue at the Supreme Court. So what, I, what we've watched over and over again in other cases is people who aren't the best arguing at the Supreme Court yeah. because they want their time in the sun yeah. Yeah. instead of what is the best we can do for this case, for this client, for this effort? And that's what everybody did here. Everybody did their part, uh, brought the highest level of excellence to everything, and we had you know, the highest level of person at the Supreme Court. And it's, it's just the way it should be if you're really operating to try to win.
And that's your real goal. We got to win for our client. We've got to do the very, very best we can do. Yeah. I want to give you 30 seconds to talk directly to our supporters, look into the camera, and just offer your thanks for their support because we couldn't do any of this without them. Yeah. Thank you. I mean, okay. think about this. Three, uh, three arguments at the Supreme Court within 12 months. Uh, none of that would have happened without you. So thank you for being a part of this. And I just I say this all the time to people in person, uh, but I'm saying it to you now. You are in the court with us. You were there. You were a, your fingerprints are all over the Coach Kennedy decision, the Carson versus Macon decision, and your fingerprints are going to be all over the Groff decision. So because of that, pray hard, <laughs> yeah. since your fingerprints are going to be on it, uh, that it'd be great, that God would use it for great things and affect a lot of people's lives in the future. But thank you. Uh, we couldn't do it unless we were doing this as a team. God bless you. Very well put. Kelly, Jeff, thank you for making time for us today. I appreciate your insights. That helped fill in the picture for me a lot, and I hope it did for a lot of other people as well. We'll obviously be keeping an eye out for the decision to be handed down. We'll let you know as soon as we hear that outcome. Sometime between now and the end of June is what we're looking at, so that's the window of time. So the prayers don't stop with the, uh, with the argument at the court. You need to keep praying because right now the justices are talking about this case and writing their opinions and figuring out what's gonna happen with this. In the meantime, we also invite you to pray for Gerald Groff. It is a very stressful thing to have your name on a case at the U.S. Supreme Court and uh, all that goes with that especially when you're challenging your employer and there are a lot of people who are expressing opinions one way or the other about him and his life and all this just pray for his peace of mind through this and that he will get the support and the people around him that he needs and if our work here at first liberty resonates with you please consider joining us just click on the big red donate button up at the top of the page on firstlibertylive.com and let me just say thank you in advance from all of us first liberty fighting for what matters most